to talk about the new relationships that God wants us to have in His new community. This is the community that God is creating. And uh, I was so thrilled, we were so thrilled that we were having communion together. Because this is, this is the, the base of Jesus giving Himself for us. This is where it all comes from. And we are to give ourselves to each other. Uh, um, because of, I suppose because we're so involved with uh, marriage and parenting and relationships, I love it when I read in the paper a story about a really long marriage. And uh, I read a story not long ago about a couple who had just celebrated their 80th wedding anniversary. Uh, to some of you, when we say we've been married 39 years, that might sound a long time to you, but I thought, 80 years? Oh my goodness, we haven't even got halfway there. But still, we're determined, we're going for it, we're going to try to, this is a world record, I should say, for the world's longest living married couple. And there was an interview with this couple, they were called Percy and Florence Arrowsmith. And Percy was 104, Florence was 100. Went like this. The marriage had been a success. Mrs. <laughs> <laughs> so, Arrowsmith, look. That's a wonderful British understatement. <laughs> uh, she said, because they still worked hard at it and never retired to bed on a quarrel. His answer was more concise. Percy attributed two words to the success of their marriage. Yes, dear. <laughs> they clearly had lost their sense of humour. And obviously, you know, humour is a very important part of a long-lasting marriage, no doubt. Mrs. Arrowsmith continued, It has not been easy, but worth every minute, because he's much more than my best friend. He's the love of my life. We don't argue much these days, only when I want to watch the soaps on television, which he hates. We have had our arguments, but we work through them together. We always go to bed as friends, and always make up before we go to sleep. Every night we kiss and hold hands. He can't settle down if I'm not holding his hand. Mr. Arrowsmith nods contentedly. Yes, dear. <laughs> but I love that story because in some ways it's rare today. You hear so many stories of, of breakup of uh, relationships. And, and as we said earlier, that's why so many people are asking the question today, how do we build strong and lasting relationships? And as I'm sure you know, the Bible is very, very practical. It tells us how. And this morning we want to look with you at a passage that we come back to again and again. It's uh, from Colossians chapter 3 and verses 12 to 17, which Sir is going to read. I think it's going to come up on the screen as well. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness and patience. Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you are called to peace. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell among you richly, as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom, and as you sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Let's pray as we sit. Let the word of Christ dwell in you, or it could be dwell among you. And Lord, we pray that your word, the word of Christ, would come to dwell within us, to speak to us deep in our hearts, every one of us this morning. Thank you for your love for us. Show us, Lord, how to love one another. For Jesus Christ's sake. 
Amen. We want to speak on just three words from that reading. Where in verse 14, St. Paul writes, Put on love. And clearly, St. Paul is not talking about feelings of love, over which, actually, we don't have control over our feelings like that. Paul is talking about love as a deliberate action, as something we do as deliberately as we might put on a shirt or put on a, a, a jacket. And notice, notice that these words are addressed to those who know they are loved. He writes, therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved. And it's to us as Christians, those of us who know that Jesus lives in us, we live in him, who know that we are dearly loved by God. And always in the Bible, it is we love out of the knowledge that we are loved. Uh, we want to talk about four very practical points for putting on love that will affect all of our relationships. That will affect our relationships with our friends, that will affect our relationships in our family, uh, at work, and marriage, if we're married, with our children, if we have children, with our grandchildren, if we're grandparents, and in dating relationships. Every relationship is affected by these four practical points. And to help you remember them, they all begin with the letter P. And it may be today there is one of these four P's that speaks particularly to you and that you want to remember and ask the Lord how you put this into practice. My first, our first P, because I'm going to do two P's and Silla's going to do two. I'm going to do one and four, she's going to do two and three, so you don't get more balanced than that. And it means that I can't speak too long to stop her doing hers. So it's very carefully balanced to understand between us. <laughs> the first P is this, be proactive. And uh, I take that from one of the items of clothing. Paul tells us to clothe ourselves with various things. And he tells us, clothe yourselves with kindness. A kind person is someone who knows another person's need and puts themselves out to meet that need. I don't know about you, but I find it very easy to be reactive, not least in our marriage. And if you're married, you will know the truth of this. There will always be things that irritate us about our husband or wife. I understand. You may think that after 39 years of marriage, after running the marriage course three times a year since 1996, Sarah and I had managed to iron every irritating habit out of our marriage. And I'm sorry if you thought that, that wouldn't be true. <laughs> I want to give you an example from our own marriage, and as it's me who's speaking, I'll just tell you something that Silla does. <laughs> I may. Uh, just by way of example, now, in our marriage, I am always the one who is first up in the morning. I get up, I go downstairs, I make, I make us both a cup of tea, we're still, still sort of slowly coming to. And uh, if I get down to the kitchen in the morning, and Scylla has done the washing up the night before, uh, and I just, by way of parenthesis, I just want to go, I do my share of washing up. I, I, am, I, I don't want to make it out that I, you know, I don't do it. But if she has done the washing up the night before, she has this irritating habit of not emptying out the washing up water. So it's still there in the bowl when I come down in the morning. And by now, of course, it's cold, the grease has all risen to the top. And it's worse than that, and it's not the worst bit. She leaves the washing up brush in the water. So I have to pull up my dressing gown sleeve, I have to fish it out, get some, and it's hot, it's awful. Get some hot water, try and get rid of this grease while the kettle is boiling so I can take some of her cup of tea. You know what? I, I feel your sympathy. <laughs> <laughs> I, I also just think I'll leave on. I just about to sit up, I did ask Silla if she could think of anything I did. It was even faintly irritating. It didn't, she didn't blink. She came up with this face. <laughs> Things. And one at the top really surprised me. She said, um, if we're late going somewhere, you always insist on polishing your shoes and make us later still. Well, I think it's a perfectly normal thing to do if you're going to be late. At least if you keep turn up with clean shoes, it might make up for it a bit more. 
So the seat is in a slightly different way. <laughs> Relationships break down if all we do is react to each other's behavior. And being proactive means focusing not on each other's behavior, but on each other's needs. And this applies to every relationship, whether it's in family, friends, work, whatever it is. Uh, my mother is now in her 80s. We've just been, we were with her before we came up here. She lives near Kelso, in the borders. And uh, just at that stage of where we needed to sell her house because she's moving into a bungalow. And that's hard for my mother. It's hard, and, and you'll know, family relationships can get strained and fractured. And I have to remember this, focus on the needs, not the behavior. Mm. We know a, um, a couple called David and Teresa Ferguson. They'd been married for 30 years when we first met them. And I remember David talking about a turning point in their marriage. He said this, for the first 15 years of our marriage, I focused on my needs and Teresa's faults. For the last 15 years of our marriage, I have focused on Teresa's needs and my faults, and our marriage has been transformed. And the question we need to ask ourselves is, do I know the needs of my friend, my mother perhaps, my child, my husband or wife? Do I know their needs at an emotional level? When, when did I at last ask them the question, how can I best help you? How can I best support you? Uh, as some of you will know, those of you who are married and who've done the marriage course, will know that on the marriage course, we, uh, there's no group discussion. It's always private discussions between the husband and wife. We make this very clear to whenever we're talking about the course. And through the course, there are, uh, there are many opportunities for husband and wife just to discuss the topic. Sometimes we give them an exercise to do, which helps them in their conversation. And one of the very early exercises, we give them a list of 60 needs or desires. And from this list, things like attention, support, affirmation, affection, comfort, security, they have to choose the three that are most important for themselves and then try to guess which are the three that are most important for their husband or wife before they exchange their manuals. And there was one wife who did the course, her husband's called Steve, and she said this. When we did that exercise, Steve put what was very important to him was affirmation. I was shocked. He'd been a very successful partner in a very large company and had an incredibly successful career. He was an upfront type of person who I didn't think needed a lot of affirmation. And I thought, I don't believe this. I've been married to this person for 22 years, and the one thing he needed, I didn't realize. Being proactive means following the example of Jesus. He, he didn't come to judge us. He, he knows our needs. And he gave himself to meet our greatest need of all on the cross. The, the Greek word that is translated kindness, clothe yourselves with kindness, just comes in three other places in the New Testament. One of them comes when Paul is writing to Titus, where he describes the gospel in these words. He says, the kindness and the love of God our Saviour appeared. Clothe yourselves with kindness. This means having outward focus, looking to the needs of the other person. The first secret of making relationships work is be proactive. And the second key, the second secret is be patient. Verse 12 says, clothe yourselves with patience. And then it follows up in verse 13, bear with one another. Relationships, we all know this, relationships get spoiled through a quick temper. And we know that any household, any home, any office, any workplace can never relax if we don't know where the next explosion is going to come from. It's, you know, or even it may not be as dramatic as an explosion, it may be the next mood someone gets into. That is not a, a very positive place or environment to be in. Now, I, 
I recognise myself, and I'm sure all of us will know, what is a trigger for us um, to lose our temper or to kind of get stressed. Um, I mean, it could be tiredness, it could be um, anxiety. For me, I know the trigger for me, one of the triggers I have to watch out for, is when we are packing up, either to go away um, somewhere, and we're going to catch a train or a ferry or a plane and we're likely to miss it, or when we're packing up at the end of a holiday and doing the same thing. And our poor children have lived for years with us, the last day of the holiday, mum getting stressed because we're trying to pack up and get to where we're meant to be going um, on time. But there is one thing above everything else that causes a quick temper, and that is when anger is buried, buried inside us, buried, and, and anger is unresolved as a result. One psychologist and counsellor said this, anger held inside becomes a hate. The key to the secret, the key to patience, the key to bearing with one another comes in the next phrase. It says, forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgiving as the Lord forgave you. Martin Luther King said this, Forgiveness is not just an occasional act, it is a permanent attitude. And that's why in the Lord's Prayer we pray, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Something that Nikki and I try to do um, on a daily basis is to pray together. And we try to pray the Lord's Prayer together. Because the Lord's Prayer is a reminder for us. I know I need to examine my heart each day and see if I am holding some resentment, some unforgiveness towards somebody else. It is challenging. It is very challenging to do that. It's, forgiveness is very hard. It, it, we can't say it's easy. It isn't easy. Forgiveness means giving up something. It means, I find, such a great analogy, it's letting go of. So rather than holding inside, holding the resentment, holding the, the anger inside, it's giving it up, letting it go. And it means letting go of a sense of our rights, of our pride, I know that's a big one for me, um, of self-pity. The Bible encourages us to put our hurts into God's hands and to leave the consequences to Him. That is the safest place to put our hurts into God's hands. If we don't forgive, I think we, we all also recognize the impact. If we don't forgive, then all our relationships are going to be affected because we are the one that will be on the short fuse and that will impact in a negative way our relationships with everyone. Nikki and I have um, a friend who, um, she's a Japanese woman called Keiko. She's been living in, um, in, in the United Kingdom in, in England for over 30 years now. And she has done, over those years, a huge amount of work to bring reconciliation between her own people, the Japanese, and um, those British people who suffered at the hands of the Japanese in the um, Second World War. She's actually won an MBE for the reconciliation work that she has done. Um, which is a wonderful thing. And there was an article recently on her work and it quoted her as saying this, when husbands who suffered terribly have been able to express forgiveness, their wives have often commented on the change in their marriage. They sleep well again and they are less easily irritated by small issues. That's what it means to let go and to forgive not to hold on and be impacted ourselves by unforgiveness. So the second P is be patient. And then the third P is be positive. I 
thing we all know, negative people are hard people to be around and to spend any time with. Um, the psychiatrist, Dr. Anthony Clare, said this, having people around you who make you feel good is the first step to human happiness. And whatever our situation, we all have so much to be thankful for. And we see Paul here three times in three verses saying, be positive about what you have. Verse 15, he says, and be thankful. In verse 16, he, say, he says, as you sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to God. And verse 17, and whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord, giving thanks to God the Father through him. And I think it's a bit like cultivating that attitude of thankfulness. When we cultivate, which is a lovely gardening image, which I don't know if any of you are gardeners here, I've got more and more and more passions about gardening, and I think there are so many spiritual um, comparisons, but the cultivating of this positive attitude, of a, a grateful attitude, um, a thankful attitude, it affects all of our relationships. Positive people are encouraging people, and they look for what is best in the other person. Um, many of you will know of somebody called Nicky Gumbel. He is the vicar of our church, HTV in London. He's also been a very, very close friend of ours for over 40 years. And um, we work together, we've worked together over the last 30 years. And I think that Nicky Gumbel is probably the most encouraging and positive person that I know. And Nicky and I are absolutely sure that we would not have done a half of what we have done in the last 30 years if it hadn't been for Nicky, Cum Nicky Gumbel's constant encouragement to us and spurring us on to do um, the things that, that he sees we should be doing. Um, just to give you an example, we've written a book called The Marriage Book, which is a book um, of both the marriage preparation course and the marriage course. And it took us three years to write. We wrote it together. Writing a book together, I don't recommend. It is quite hard work. Um, but anyway, I know that book would not have been written if it hadn't been for the encouragement um, that Nikki gave us. And we, all of us, need courage to do the things that we feel God is calling us to do. It's not like, you know, you feel God calling you to do it, you just have supreme confidence and you step out and do it. Not at all. We all feel inadequate. We all lack courage. And encouragement for another person is so life-giving. It's incredibly important in our family relationships. And I just want to tell you one time when I got it seriously wrong. Um, we have four children and we have a girl and three boys. And I, I remember a time when our middle son was 14 and we were really struggling in our relationship. He and I are very similar, so that's <laughs> off on the way. And um, anyway, we were really, really struggling and I knew something was not in good shape. And actually the, the, the wake up call came when I realized it was me that was the problem. Not him, it was me that was the problem. Because one day he said to me, Mom, why are you always so stressed with me? And that brought me up short because I realized that actually, um, I was so worried about him, what he might be getting up to, what I didn't know, what he was doing, da 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 da, -da all that with a teenage son. And actually, that made me very stressed in my whole mindset towards him. And I would, um, be critical towards him. I'd be on his back and my voice, he said my voice just would rise higher and higher and higher and higher and higher. So I was like, what are you doing? You know. And in the end, what happened was I gave him permission to say to me when my voice was getting like that and I was getting stressed. And you know, that was the most liberating thing. It helped me because I didn't even realize I was doing it. And he would do that a few times and say, Mom, you're getting stressed. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I consciously had to make a change in my attitude. I had to ask God to help me to become more positive and more encouraging 
in the way that I spoke to him. And I can honestly say it totally changed our relationship. And we are great friends now. He's aged 30. So <laughs> yeah, we, we do get on very well indeed. Um, um, there is another exercise that we do on the marriage course which we get the couples to do, and I think it's my favorite exercise. It's called showing appreciation. And what we get a couple to do is individually, the husband and wife, to write down six things that they appreciate about their partner. And we also say to them, when you're writing, it really is worth coming up with six, because otherwise it might be a bit stressful. Um, <laughs> and then we get them to show their partner. And you know, it is such a wonderful thing when we see people reading the things that their partner has written about them. And that is the power of appreciation, of being positive, of saying encouraging things to one another. And Nikki and I have realized in our own marriage that the more we express appreciation to each other, there's this wonderful virtual circle, the more appreciative we are of one another. So, are you okay. going to do a little? A yeah, little? I'm doing a little review. See if you can remember the three P's so far. The first P is B. Proactive. Well done. Second P is be patient. Third P is be positive. And the fourth P is be peaceful. And by that, what I mean is be full of God's peace. Just after writing those three words, put on love, Paul writes, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. When we are at peace on the inside, we can be at peace on the outside. And as I said earlier, it's when we know we are loved, we are able to love others. I want to finish with a story of a couple called Billy and Debbie. They were in their thirties, they lived in Northern Ireland, they'd been married for eight years, neither of them had any church involvement. When Billy's dad died, he made a conscious decision to harden himself, not to let himself get close to anybody, because he didn't want to be hurt like that again. Billy became bad-tempered and not much fun to be around. When Debbie's mother died, Debbie was very upset. Billy said Debbie hadn't been much help to him when his parents died, so why should he be of any help to her? Instead, he started to blame her that their marriage was falling apart. They went on a romantic weekend to Paris to try to patch things up, and they said they, they still loved each other, but they couldn't talk to each other. And Debbie said, our relationship was coming to an end. I couldn't fix it, and neither could Billy. And at that point, they met some Christians in Northern Ireland called Peter and Beryl. And Peter and Beryl invited them to do Alpha in their home. There were, they said, Billy and David said there were about 10, 12 people meeting in their sitting room. And after the meal, uh, Peter said they were going to watch a talk on the TV. And uh, Debbie thought it was going to be really boring, but she said it wasn't. It was really interesting. And uh, as the weeks went on, both of them got more and more excited by what they were hearing. And back at home, after the third week of Alpha, by which time Debbie had already committed her life to Christ, Billy sat on his bed and he said this to God, Lord, I've lived in this world for 32 years without you, and I've heard about you for the first time. I'm so, so sorry for all the things I've done wrong. I need you in my life. And then he described what happened. He said, as the weeks went on, I started to forgive everyone who'd ever hurt me in my life. And I felt the bitterness being lifted from my heart. Debbie said, after that, our marriage began to mend big time. It felt like we just started all over again. And all those years before were just nothing. I felt like I hadn't lived. I felt like I was opening my eyes for the very first time, seeing everything new and fresh. As for Billy, he was like a new person, more loving, caring. I fell in love with him all over again. And Billy concluded, what God has done in my life is amazing. I was the most ungentle person you've ever met. And God has come into my life and turned it around. Patience wasn't a virtue for me, I didn't have it. But now I find I rarely get angry. I don't raise my voice. I couldn't possibly have made that much of a change in myself on my own. 
There is only one person responsible. Jesus. It's Jesus. 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 Uh, Billy had only been a Christian for a few weeks. I, I don't know if you realize that's a pretty good summary of the whole letter <laughs> to the Colossians, actually, the whole of the New Testament. So Paul writes, Put on love today and every day. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Let God's word shape all of our relationships. Be proactive, be patient, be positive. Be peaceful. And you know, the early church grew rapidly because people all around them were, were amazed and impressed by the quality of the relationships that they saw amongst Christians. It was this new community and these new relationships that caused the gospel to spread. 